to me, central to the concept, uh, to the idea of ecological reparation is the concept of repair, that uh, technologies, the materialities of technologies, the, the hardest part, perhaps, of technologies, of artifacts in general, of materialities, uh, can be repaired, uh, can be repaired, can be maintained, can be modified, can be reconfigured in a manner that will move us away from what we're experiencing right now, what we have been experiencing in the recent decades and the recent centuries, meaning environmental destruction, ecological destruction. Uh, and I have been thinking this in connection to what arguably is central to ecological reparation, and this is energy technologies. Energy technologies are to a large extent responsible for, for being here, for, being, uh, for, for the destruction of the environment. So it is to energy technologies that we need to put a lot of thought in the direction of ecological reparation. My central suggestion here, if I may actually move on to a suggestion based on you know, my scholarship in the last 25 years, would be to go towards a scenario where energy generation infrastructures are small, small scale, as small scale as possible, as local as possible, as decentralized as possible, so as to, to be able to actually uh, repair them. Locally. I want to do a step back and ask you to tell us a bit more about uh, the problems that large scale closed systems of energy uh, generation create. The bulk of my work in the last three decades was on the instability of large scale infrastructures, uh, or better, to be more accurate, on the trade off between efficiency and instability. And I think here lies the central problem with large-scale infrastructures. They may appear efficient from a narrow definition, according to a narrow definition of efficiency, but on the other hand, this efficiency comes at a great cost. It comes with instabilities, vulnerabilities to blackout, and above all, the idea of assuming that there is an environment out there to which you can channel all the byproducts, the undesirable byproducts. That's where the stability comes in these large infrastructures. Whereas with small infrastructures, the stability comes from care. One of the questions you explore in your work is this concept of closed technologies. And, and that is something that we find really interesting and we would like to ask you, what, is, what are closed technologies and what are the issues that, that they pose? One important difference I will schematize here is between technologies that are open, uh, meaning that there is no difference, there is no concealment, there is no black boxing, there is no encasement. There is no differentiation between an interior and an exterior, an inside and an outside part. So everybody uh, can see the interior. There is no interior, actually. In this case, the idea of repairability, the idea of the concept of reparation actually applies very well because you can see what it is. Everybody can see it with you. It's a public and open process. So people, in the context of thinking about reparation and what kind of technologies of artifacts, of infrastructures would be compatible with this, can publicly see everything and together discuss and plan and modify and reconfigure. This, historically, for example, has been the case with uh, 5 million, for example, wind turbines and other wind, wind energy infrastructures installed in the western part of the United States or in other areas of the world, including uh, some areas in Greece. On the other hand, we have what some philosophers call devices. Uh, a device is a technological materiality, not just any materiality, a technological materiality uh, that is based on, on you, the user and everybody else, having access only to a part displayed, the numbers, for example, the digits, the control part, but you don't see the internal workings. You cannot see, for example, if there is a mechanism inside the technology that channels the access to, to the environment and therefore destroys the environment. So 
whatever may be may may be that is going wrong with with technology in terms of how it performs uh, from the perspective of, of ecological reparation, the key, in my view, in my opinion, is to move towards opening up the technology and constructing open technologies. Can you tell us a bit more? Um about the specific examples uh, you mentioned, for example, the windmills in the United States? My my first reference would be a book with historic photographs uh, of, uh, of some wind apparatus, wind structures, wind infrastructures, if you prefer, that were used in uh, the interwar period in the United States. And what I think is very attractive about these structures And what the protagonists, what people at the time thought that it was very attractive, is the fact that one could walk, uh, climb on them, and take pictures with them because there was no interior and exterior. We have some wonderful pictures um, with uh, ladies dressed uh, nicely and, and, and walking up these structures and taking pictures with them. Um, there are other examples in Greece. Uh, in Crete at the Lassifi Plateau for about 50-60 years uh, a community the community of villagers living there without any support, technical support from outside uh, just based on some local technicians they built about 15,000 uh, wind pump structures which were used to pump water uh, when there was wind and um, to store this water, and then to water the land, the fields, when appropriate. Now, these people build um, these 15,000 uh, infrastructures, open infrastructures. There is no, again, interior and exterior, by relying on local materials, on local skills, very humble skills. And uh, they use them in the middle of, 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 of the 20th century industrial civilization, to actually enhance their productivity without having to resort to, without relying on uh, closed infrastructures. There are many, many, I think, more historical examples. Uh, I chose these examples because uh, they clearly don't refer to a primitive past. We are in the middle of the 20th century and a farmer, and his, her family in the United States could buy such an infrastructure and use it to have connection to, to the telephone, uh, connect to, to radio, to radio, have access to, to radio, and all other basic appliances just by, let's say, a 10-meter uh, wind uh, electricity generator that could be bought. It was not cheap but it could be bought at a price comparable to a working class car, for example. These communities you, dis you describe who are doing these collective reappropriations of the way to, to produce energy locally, if these communities, um, like if, if in your view, we could discuss what these communities are doing uh, from the perspective also of social justice. In the case of the the wind structures that I mentioned uh, uh, used historically in the US, in Greece, in, in the UK, for example. The emphasis was on care. When you care about something, um, the last thing that you want is to destroy it. The last thing that you want is to actually take advantage of someone else. Whereas the large-scale energy infrastructures uh, are built around the idea of maximizing profit. Uh, capital is profit. It's a symbol of that. The difference is huge. Care versus profit. Personal, certain, certain people who care, and they cannot be unjust to those around them at the local level, versus faceless owners of these huge uh, energy infrastructures who just try to maximize profit. What about the question of storage? Because one, one, one question is always the question of generation and the other question is the question of storage. Simple solutions based on traditional, uh, well-known alternatives based on mechanical means when possible 
as opposed to storage based on a large scale and on supposedly smart materials. We now know all smartness comes with a cost. What we actually need is communities to use the resources around wisely and devise a build storage alternatives. Again, a multitude of them, very different. That's the whole idea. You adjust it to the small structural generation. So how do we make the transition from the large scale infrastructures to the local infrastructures? The big issue for me is to manage to release the most creative, uh, uh, manage to inspire younger people, everybody, but younger people in particular, who so much believe, who, who realize the destruction of the environment and so much want and transition towards a, a, a more ecological society, who want to, to work as much as they can uh, to pursue ecological reparation. The big thing, in my opinion, is to actually uh, find ways to connect to their inspirations, to connect to their vision, to connect to their political will, if you prefer, towards an environmentally just society, toward ecological reparation, and somehow manage to expose them to the fact that uh, the only alternative is not huge, large energy infrastructures. In fact, with creativity and the study of the historical past, and, sociolog and sociological examples from the present, then one can do miracles. Uh, I want to be honest. I'm not sure that we will manage it. Uh, I hope we are not beyond the point that we can save the planet and ourselves and future generations. But at least to give the fight, I think it's very important to try to think of energy not in terms of uh, one-way paths, to think of a multitude of possibilities for small infrastructures, local, uh, owned by the community, owned by individuals, run, built by local materials, and built and run around here. 